Hello, everyone, and welcome to the NRWN's uh, TikTok, not TikTok. Uh, here today, we are with uh, Tim McDermott from OSU. Um, and just a reminder on how live events work, we have a Q&A on the side. Use that if you want to ask any questions, and we'll probably leave, uh, we'll just keep those for at the end unless they're particularly relevant, and I will uh, interrupt Timothy to answer your questions. Um, but go ahead and utilize that, and then this will also be available after the fact, um, recorded and put on our SharePoint site. Uh, so if you want to share it around to ODNR people that, that couldn't be here today, they will be able to watch it. Um, so I will turn it over to Laura Kearns, and she can go ahead and take it from here. Hi everyone, I'm Laura Kearns. I'm an employee in the Division of Wildlife, but I'm also a member of the um, Natural Resource Women's Network Executive Committee. And we uh, are honored to have uh, Dr. Tim McDermott here from Ohio State today uh, to talk to us about ticks. And he's been an extension educator for the past seven years after 20 years in private practice veterinary medicine and surgery. He lectures from locally to internationally on ticks and tick vector disease to industry, government agencies like us, uh, universities, public health organizations on ways to keep you, your family and your animals tick safe. So uh, with that, Tim, we'll let you take it away. Awesome, you can hear me okay? Yes. Okay, good because I can't see you, um, but I can hear you guys just fine. So I can also not see the chat, but I will make sure that we leave time at the end uh, to address any questions that way. So like, I think it is a good idea though, if you would come to a, a break or a spot in there where there's a particularly pertinent question, so it doesn't fall away, feel free to interrupt. That won't bug me at all. So I'm gonna give you an update on tick um, for the most part here in Ohio in 2022. And what I like to stress is that there are a lot of myths out there when we talk about ticks. These myths have been around for a long time. We have found that the um, there has been explosive growth in ticks and tick vector disease in, in a relatively short time. So you guys work out in the woods. I grew up in the woods and so Back in the day when I would run around in the woods, I'd get a tick on me. I would, you know, squish it, pull it off. There was nothing really to worry about in terms of tick vector disease, but we have to break those myths now because it is different now. So the first myth is that ticks are only active in summer. And in fact, ticks have activity all year long. We have positive cases of disease that have been diagnosed every month of the year in different places throughout Ohio. And it, what's really helpful to understand why this is, is because ticks live a long time. When you think of tiny little critters, you don't think that they live a long time, like a week or a month or something like that. But ticks live for years. And most of the ticks of medical consequence to us are at least a two year life cycle. And in fact, they can have periods of hypobiosis if the conditions aren't right to feed that can extend that. And then myth number two is that ticks prefer the woods. And what we have found, and, and we're gonna go through the five ticks of uh, medical importance here shortly, but what we have found is that some like the woods, some are just fine with an open area like a meadow or a, you know, a pasture or even a backyard lawn. And then myth number three is that a tick needs to be on you and feeding for a full day before the risk of disease can be vectored into you in ticks vector um, viral disease, bacterial disease, protozoal, and you're even associated with a allergic syndrome. And what uh, the research is showing us is that it is much faster potentially. So this drives the point home and this was last December, but we had the first case of Powassan virus and encephalitis that was vectored by the black-legged tick, also known as a deer tick in Columbiana County. That is over in the largest sort of red hot hot spots of Ohio, which is in the eastern central portion of the state. And that shows that there's disease possible because that was December in Ohio. And while it was not the um, coldest December we had, it showed there was still tick activity then. And so here is the life cycle of the deer tick, and that is from the CDC. And as you can see, it, it takes a while. It goes through multiple seasons. We have eggs that are laid in the spring and they mature as they feed on different hosts through their larval and then nymphal form. This is a three life stage tick before they go into adults. And this takes a, this is a two year life state or life cycle maturation in uh, ideal case. 
So when we talk about disease transmission, the original data we had was from the CDC with black-legged tick adults vectoring Lyme disease to humans. And what we have found over time and are continuing to find, this presentation um, changes as I get new research. I change and update this presentation every two to four weeks. We have different attachment times depending on a number of variables from the, from the research. And those variables include not only what type of tick it is, which tick species it is, but what life stage it is. And it also depends on what disease it is. So this is the, this is the hypostome, that's the feeding mouth part of a tick, and that gets injected into the host, and you can see it's, it's barbed like fish hooks in it. Then there's a ton of different things secreted in the tick in order to make sure that it facilitates its feeding. It secretes a cement to hold on, it secretes an anesthetic so we don't feel that giant mouth part piercing in, and it secretes anticoagulant because they'll feed for seven to 10 days. Depending on the tick, the life stage, and the disease, it depends on how quickly you can be uh, exposed to that. So we have found that Lyme 24 hours is, is correct. And what that means is assuming the tick has the disease in it at the 24 hour period or so, it's a linear correlation. If the tick has the disease there, the longer it feeds on you, the larger chance that you'll get that disease. But we're finding that there are certain diseases that live in different parts of the tick, and they might live in the gut, they might live in the salivary glands right close to the mouth parts and get secreted in very quickly. And in fact, um, we, we know that there are multiple diseases that can be vectored in as, as fast as three to six hours. Uh, and experimentally in Powassan virus uh, in mice, they found transmission in 15 minutes. Plus we're gonna talk about an allergy that your immune system can react very quickly. Everybody knows how fast you can react to say a peanut allergy or a bee sting, that you might uh, actually have even less time than that. Okay, so there are five ticks of medical consequence in Ohio currently, and those are the ones that are listed, American dog tick, black legged or deer tick, Lone Star, Gulf Coast, and Longhorn tick, and we're gonna go eat through each of them and sort of when they came up on our radar. But what I wanna show you is the picture that you see here with the finger, and this shows that we have some Lone Stars uh, on the tip, and then we got some black legged ticks right here. Um, or I'm sorry, we have American dog ticks in the middle and we got some black legged ticks here. And you can see that the deer ticks are relatively small compared to say the giant um, uh, American dog ticks. But then you look at this little rascal right here, all the way to the left, that is a black legged tick nymph. And in fact, this little guy, which is as big as the period at the end of a sentence, um, about the size of a poppy seed is fully capable of vectoring disease to you. And so when you look at these, they're tiny, tiny, right? I know who this uh, person is, and, and this is not a giant finger. Her finger is normal size. So these are very, very tiny. Even when they get as big as they can get, their nymphs are very tiny and can vector disease to you. And you're gonna find almost impossible to detect. So the first tick of medical consequence to humans, companion animals, and livestock that we had in Ohio is the American dog tick. And I practiced as a veterinarian for 20 years before I joined Extension. This is the one that I fought in practice for the majority of my practice career. It's been around for a long, long time. This is a fairly large size tick. This is one, and, and I really wanna point out just a couple of things on this slide. One is this map, and this is a, a map of the host range. Uh, where these ticks are found, and it is the majority of half of the United States. We are now finding that this map is getting close to obsolete because we are finding through citizen science American dog ticks submitted from other states out here. And when we think of ticks, note that different tick species vector or transmit uh, carry disease that they can then transmit to a host. Uh, several different diseases generally, but they don't all transmit all of them. They kind of have their favorites. And for the American dog tick, uh, the number one disease it, it vectors or transmits would be Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever. This is a tick that is more of an open habitat tick. This is one you're gonna find in a pasture or a meadow. Uh, last two American dog ticks that I found on me were when I was sitting in lawns. Actually, one of them, I was on a lawn chair and it was crawling up my leg in just backyards in Columbus, Ohio. All right, 
The black legged ticker, the deer tick, is the next one, and this was positively identified in Ohio for the first time in Coshocton County in 2010. But I'm going to show you a county map uh, that will indicate that it's probably been here longer than that. And currently, and I say currently, this is number one on my hit list for medical importance and, and what it can do and, and the devastating thing that it can transmit. This is one that, um, this is the 2014 map. So 2010, right around here, Coshocton, you can see that it, uh, in and it generally started over in New England as it did its migration. This one has a number of different diseases that it can vector. Anaplasmosis, it can vector Lyme disease or Borreliosis, um, Ehrlichia, and then Powassan virus encephalitis. And if you remember that map that we looked at from the American dog tick, as of 2019, it is filled in with a very similar looking map to the eastern half host range of the American dog tick. There is a Pacific black-legged tick, so there is one that is over here. And again, we're seeing little hot spots of where tick can go, because if there's one thing that we found out, ticks are extraordinarily elite at adapting to a new spot, and they will and are moving with global climate change and they move on wildlife or livestock shipments very, very easily. So for them to go to a new place is pretty simple and for them to establish, uh, since they're good at it, they commonly do that. All right, now we have much better data on Lyme disease and the black-legged ticks than we have on all the other species and all the other diseases. And so I'm gonna go through a few slides, but I wanna point out some things that um, you know show that we really here in Ohio have a reporting problem. We don't have as much data collected at the public health level to give us an adequate picture. And we're working on that. Um, we, we have new, numerous research projects that we're doing at Ohio State trying to collect ticks. We're working with ODA. We're working with various public health orgs uh, in multiple counties and multiple regions of Ohio. Every tick we want to get submitted for identification, and then they will eventually make their way to Ohio State where they'll be tested for pathogens. And then we can build a better chart that shows exactly what we got and, and where we got it and how much we got it. And then there's places where people are doing really good job. One of the things to note is there's underreporting. We have a reporting problem everywhere. There is underreporting by a factor of 10, as it is estimated. And um, a colleague of mine, Kirby Stafford, who works for UConn, he just retired. He's a, he is a giant in the tick world. And he estimates that we're underreporting by a factor of 10. So we have close to 50,000 cases reported positively each year. The CDC estimates we're closer to a half a million Lyme disease cases per year. And I'm going to show you some interesting metadata here in a minute. But as you look at this map, and these are the reported cases of Lyme disease, I mean, you can see a razor's edge here in, in northeastern Ohio on the border of Pennsylvania and Ohio, and, and that doesn't exist. There is no line of, um, you know, repellents where ticks don't walk across the border into Ohio or get carried on a deer. So all the dark blue here should be all the dark blue right here. And in fact, when you look at where we have cases, we do have some heavy, heavy cases right around here. This is where the Lyme disease numbers are just absolutely through the roof. And it's not just the country, okay? So take a look at Franklin County here, take a look down around Cincinnati, take a look up around Cleveland. Uh, the, the, the ticks can travel on deer and we have tremendous deer pressure here in, in Franklin County. Um, we have uh, lots of deer per square mile because we have these little pocket forests and, and they'll congregate in there as a relative place of safety. But we talked about Coshocton County right here as being the first place that it was identified, but it would have walked from Pennsylvania. So as you can see, it, it would have been in all these counties as well. And I go to all these counties frequently to talk. Um, interestingly, I did a, pro a program in Tuscarawas County earlier this year, and it was just a dynamite program. They had lined up in partnership with Tusk Public Health and uh, a doctor in their um, hospital organization there, and then a teacher in Tuscarawas High School or New Philly High School. I'm not sure which the name of the high school was, but, but that teacher engages his students in citizen science and he takes them out. He had borrowed a PCR machine from a colleague at Ohio State, so they would do tick drags and tick collections in various places in Tuscarawas County and they would map them for positivity rates because like I said, the tick has to have the disease when it feeds on you in order to transmit it to you. If it doesn't have disease, it's just gross and it sucked a bunch of your blood. It, or that takes out the allergy potential. We'll talk about that here in a minute. But his students were mapping various uh, wild areas in Tuscarawas County and they had variable 
um, levels of positivity, but they had some levels of positivity high, like 70, 80, 90 percent. And in fact, if you go back to the map of the blue dot uh, in my Google feed uh, earlier this year, they did a tick drag at a public park in sort of east central or west central Pennsylvania, somewhere around here. So a public park, they did tick drags. They collected deer ticks, the black legged ticks. They tested them for Powassan virus encephalitis, which is just a devastating, horrible disease. And they found that 78% of ticks were positive. What we're seeing across Ohio is in any given county, 40 to 60% of ticks are positive for disease. And so I tell folks, and I, I say it meaning it, even though I know it doesn't sound um, like it's doable, but you don't want to get bit by a tick ever for the rest of your life. Okay, so when we look at seasonality, we we take a look at this chart right here because again, it's all year round, right? The numbers never go to zero. Uh, Tuscarawas Public Health said that they get positive Lyme cases every month of the year there. But we have a seasonality and it's based on life stage because because you saw that wheel and through the progression of it, but we're right here. OK, we're actually still pretty darn high in the number of black legged ticks that are out there and the weather's conducive to it. So if you are out in the field today, you are in deer tick, thick deer tick habitat. You really have an exposure risk. Now we have 40 degrees coming up that will slow it down a little bit, but it's not going to eliminate that. And so, like I said, they're collecting met metadata from different places, and this is data collected from private insurance claims with Lyme disease diagnosis. And we see, you know, we're seeing explosive growth in rural areas um, from, from 2007 to 2021, 357. We're also seeing pretty heavy duty growth in urban areas. And in fact, when you look at the Lyme disease diagnosis rates, we see a spike in rural areas in the summer. People are outside, but then when we get to the cold weather, the positivity for cases actually is greater in urban counties, probably due to urban uh, heat effects out there, but but probably due to several different things. Um, but it goes to show doesn't matter what time of year it is, and it doesn't matter whether you're in the country or the city, you have a chance of uh, encountering a tick. And then they did giant metadata, um, and this is blood studies that were done uh, with a huge population globally and in North America. And, and this really drives the point home about how prevalent tick vector disease is, right? Nine and a half percent of people in North America have already had Lyme disease. And then in the world, it's almost 14 percent. That's just crazy. And then one of the things that, that I like to drive home when I talk to parents or 4-H or youth or things like that is, when we look at what age groups most commonly will encounter Lyme disease, we find that it's our, 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 our highest priority group, right? The kids. Our kids are so much more likely to encounter uh, a tick and, and get disease because they're not really, they're not scouting, they're not tick dragging, they're not doing tick, you know, checks when they come out. They're probably not wearing permethrin treated clothes and putting on repellents. If they're like me when I was a kid or my kids when they were younger, they're just crawling around in the woods and they're getting ticks on them and they're getting Lyme disease or Rocky Mountain spotted fever or things like that. And so we really want to make sure that we, we all raise awareness of ticks and tick-borne disease so that we can start to get the word out for people to take those protective plans and make their personal protective plan for safety. Okay, pick number three of medical importance and arrived in Ohio, probably coming up from the south and crossing the river, and the river has never stopped tick ever, but that's a lone star tick sometime in the 2012, 13, 14, 15, something like that time frame. it was here in Ohio. And the lone star tick is one that has a very similar pattern. In fact, this is a little bit of an older map. It extends all the way up into the upper Midwest. It basically looks exactly like the eastern half of the United States host range map for deer ticks and American dog ticks. And lone star ticks, like the deer tick, are a woodland preferential tick. Lone star ticks are actually much more aggressive feeders of uh, of people, livestock, you name it. They'll eat about anything. The deer tick will feed on any number of hosts. Um, in fact, tick and vector Lyme disease, not only to people, but to horses, dogs, and cats. 
the um, the Lone Star is one that while it's found in, in all over Ohio, its preference is going to be those heavily wooded counties, especially the Riverbend counties here. So you have your Lyme disease hotspot here, but that's extending. And then you have your Lone Star um, range here, but that's also extending. And then the Lone Star um, tick, one of the things of note about that tick is it's associated with an allergic syndrome. And the the thing about it is, is there are some chemical similarities in the saliva of the Lone Star tick that are uh, very similar to carbohydrates in non-primate mammalian muscle. And what that means is there's an association with that tick bite to developing an allergy to non-primate mammalian muscle, which means if you react negatively to a Lone Star tick bite, you could become allergic to beef, pork, venison, and lamb which means you just became allergic to a bacon cheeseburger. And since bacon cheeseburgers are my absolute favorite food, that is a tremendous concern for me um, and for a lot of people. And in fact, where the Lone Star Tick is most prevalent in Ohio is where we have a lot of cattlemen's organizations and we do a lot of our livestock grazing. And it's not uncommon for me to go to a cattleman's organization and actually have folks that raise beef for their life's work that are allergic to eating beef, which tremendously negatively impacts their life. Now, one of the things I'm starting to see reports of is the allergy, which is called mammalian muscle allergy or alpha-gal after, um, after the, the carbohydrate and the enzyme that is noted for that. But we're starting to see reports of this allergy in places where there are no Lone Star ticks. And so the concern would be that not just this tick can potentially induce this allergy in, in people that get bit by it. So, We've gone through three, now let's get caught up to within the last few years. And so in 2020, we had the first confirmed established colonies of the Gulf Coast tick here in Ohio. And I say established colonies because we had seen a few here and there, but we had not had them confirmed in there. And so this is the Gulf Coast tick. And the Gulf Coast tick has been around for a long, long time. This is not a new tick, it is not an invasive tick. It has been noted in the literature as being identified as early as the 1880s, especially down around here in the Texas border because it was associated with economic loss uh, in the cattle industry. And so since that point though, we've had expansion of the Gulf Coast tick. So I'm gonna trace the, just the regular original sort of Gulf Coast habitat and you can see that this is a sort of Gulf Coast um, marshy grasses. This is a tick that can do the sort of warmer weather and it can do a more open habitat and grasslands. And then you'll note that there's sort of a extension of this host range that moves through Arkansas and into Oklahoma. And what that is, is in the 1970s or so, there were cattle shipments out of this grazing area down here, up here, where they were gonna be fed out and there were Gulf Coast ticks on those cattle. And basically what happened is they moved the ticks with a host into a area that is similar enough to where they were from that they were able to colonize it. And that got us started with the Gulf Coast tick. And then from this expansion, we started to see the Gulf Coast tick make its way up the Mississippi to the Ohio River watershed. And it moved slowly up this way over decades and decades until, and probably driven by global climate change. But we have our first positive cases right here around Cincinnati, sort of that Hamilton, Butler, Claremont um, uh, area. And, and that is where we have that. And, and we expect this tick to spread. This tick, um, can vector diseases to cattle, to dogs, and to people. It actually vectors a disease that is very similar to uh, Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, but sort of a lighter version to people. And so I wasn't able to find a map, although I'd probably need to do a better look at it. So I took and made uh, this drawing. I have very, very mad PowerPoint skills. I think you guys can all agree about that. This drawing, which looks like a turtle crawling up the eastern half of the United States, is where we're seeing positive cases of the Gulf Coast tick now. It is extended through this area up to Maine and is uh, starting to move um, and expand into the Midwest as well. All right, and then in 2017, I started to get articles drop into my Google feed about this tick, which is the Asian longhorn tick. And in 2017, in the fall, there was the first, 
confirmed outbreak of this tick on a farm in New Jersey. And this was a farm, a small ruminant farm. And the farmer went in to check on his sheep and there was uh, sheep that were covered in ticks, just absolutely covered in ticks. So many ticks were in the stall that the ticks were crawling up on the farmer. And then when they he called the vet to check them out, there's ticks crawling all over the vet. There was just tremendous numbers of them. So they called the feds in because they really couldn't identify this tick and its behavior was unusual. And the feds came and identified the Asian longhorn tick. And when they questioned the farmer and they found the provenance of the sheep or the family or the neighbors, nobody had been to East Asia. And, and while we have sifted through old tick submission samples and we have found that it probably came in around 2010 somewhere in the, in the United States, we really don't know how it established a beachhead there in New Jersey and just really, really expanded in a tremendous amount on that farm. So they treated the farm and the animal um, with the caricides and when they came back in the spring, it was still present there. And so what we've seen over time is an expansion of this tick. And then what we want to do is we want to figure out, does this tick have the ability to transmit the diseases that we have here? Because it's not from here. And like I said, not every tick transmits every disease. We know over in, in its native area, this tick transmits devastating disease. Um, but we've been monitoring and we have found that uh, in, in 2020, it was confirmed to be able to transmit thyleria to cattle. So thyleria is a protozoal parasite of cattle. It can cause mortality. It has no treatment. Um, our first positive case of thyloritis uh, in Ohio was in Monroe County, right across the border from West Virginia, uh, just a few months ago uh, by a veterinarian who's a friend of mine. And so we have this tick in Ohio now. Um, and we know it transmits disease. Unfortunately, we're starting to figure out that this tick, while it, it can't transmit everything, it can transmit some pretty deadly stuff. And in fact, this is one that as a competent um, transmitter of Powassan virus, and, and the horrible thing is not only can it transmit it horizontally, right? It can give it to something else, but it, can, it has vertical transmission, which means mama can actually um, lay eggs and that can be uh, something that her babies can then transmit. And the worry about that is this tick has a very unusual reproductive uh, method in, in terms of ticks. It can reproduce via parthenogenesis. And parthenogenesis means that this tick can, um, can reproduce, the female does not need a male to mate with. She can just spontaneously lay eggs. And in fact, males are rare. The ticks that were found on that Jersey farm, and when we see big outbreaks, it's similar. They're all genetic clones of the mama. She can lay tons and tons of eggs, which means you get one female and that can start an outbreak in any given space. Right now we have it in 17 states um, and we have it in Ohio in several places. The, um, the first place that we found it was in Gallia County, a colleague of mine here, Risa Pesapane. Um, she had been given a, a tick that was submitted off a dog that went to a rescue organization. This was a grant sponsored program that she had to uh, obtain ticks for examination. And that dog had the first case, uh, that was 2020 in, in Gallia County, which is pretty much straight south almost. Um, and then we, uh, in 2021, when we were sort of figuring out how we were going to test other places for this tick, I mentioned that we had a research farm in the neighboring county of Jackson, and they were going to be working their cattle shortly. So Risa went down in there with her students and, and they checked the cattle and they found one tick on a cow in Jackson County. But then uh, later in that summer, I got a call or a phone. I got an email which led to a call from a colleague of mine in Monroe County. He was a recently retired ag educator, the same position that I had. I'm in Franklin. He's in Monroe. And he's a cattleman and across the lane. His neighbor's a cattleman. And when his neighbor woke up and checked his herd, he found three dead animals. And when my colleague went over there to help uh, with those animals and examine them, he found they were covered with ticks. So when he contacted me and he explained that situation, uh, that's extraordinarily unusual for us to find, and meaning it, it never happened before. So my worry immediately went to the Asian longhorn tick. So Reese and her students went there in Tyvek and they did a tick drag. And if you're familiar with a tick drag, it's basically a one yard square piece of cloth and you drop it down and then you swipe it up and you take a cat or a lint hair roller and um, 
you swipe it on that and you see if you got lucky and found a tick. And this was the result of the tick drag on the first square meter that they walked in the gate and dropped this into the grass. And on this roller, you have two adult ticks and every other speck on here is a nymphal Asian longhorn tick. And in fact, the working diagnosis is that the animals went into this pasture, which was overgrown at the time, and the tick pressure had built up into the millions. And when they walked in, they were overwhelmed, absolutely overwhelmed. The ticks just crawled on them. And through a combination of, of um, a blood loss, anemia, and shock, they killed three animals. And these were tiny animals or young animals. This was two mature cows and their bull. This tick has been known to cause mortality from disease transmission and can also cause mortality simply because so many of them can exist on an animal that they actually can um, suck enough blood to kill them. They can kill a calf I've seen in five days. So they have a seasonality chart right now and they're winding down their season. This is a tick that is not as active in the cold months because this is a tick that comes from a warmer area. And so this is one that we will see big spikes and in fact, we have had outbreaks on cattle where we have ticks in the thousands and, and when we look at that we're, we're noting there's some causality. Generally they're right around July when you get this big um, you get this spike big spike of of larval forms and the animals go into these pastures that are overgrown where there's just millions of ticks and they just swarm on the um, on the animals. And so this is the seasonality chart. We're gonna have tons and tons of nymphs and then we get adults and egg and we have um, our nymphs then mature into larval forms and then as they overwinter, they emerge and then they feed and mature into adults and then go over that. This is also a two year life state or life cycle tick and a three stage like the deer tick. So here is my county map for where we've had positivity and we added um, this year we added Morgan County and we added Belmont County and the first outbreaks were Gallia and Monroe and, and the ticks would have crossed the river from West Virginia because the river stops nothing and then you can see Gallia here. We anticipate that there and more. We're waiting on another county over here and if you'll notice we have a gold star here in Franklin County because within the last month we had a positive um, tick identification uh, from a person in Franklin County who works in a public health organization and felt and then saw um, a little tiny uh, nymph of an Asian longhorn tick and then sent it in for identification. And like I said, we are waiting on one more. So we have six that have been confirmed by NBSL, which is the National Veterinary uh, Laboratory, and we're waiting on number seven. Okay. So then they model it, right? We need to figure out, we need to develop a map like those other maps to try to figure out where this tick is gonna take over here in the United States. And so this is a, a map that came out um, about a year or so ago. And they, did, they took three different models and they overlaid them. And what they found is, is where one model agreed, only one model, it was the light tan. And where two models agreed, it would have been the butterscotch color. And when all three models agree, it is uh, that bright red and, and you can see that it's a lot of warm climate or, or temperate climate that doesn't get too cold is where this tick is uh, predicted to establish around, you know, where you have some lake effect and other things like that, plus the south and, and the Caribbean and Mexico. But if you look really closely at Ohio, which is right here, you'll note that only two models actually thought that this tick was going to be uh, in that sort of wooded Appalachian area. And in, in fact, what we've seen is uh, five out of our six positives in terms of county have all been in that wooded Appalachian area. Now they've been in wooded Appalachia, but generally on pasture on cattle, probably brought there by livestock. And in fact, this tick has been found on five different um, passerine birds and uh, migratory waterfowl. And like we have heard and we know, it takes only one tick to establish a colony somewhere. So we anticipate this tick uh, expanding and, and likely being endemic here. Uh, my colleague Reese and I wrote a fact sheet. So if you're interested in learning a little bit more, especially on preventative measures and just a deeper dive in this, you can find this on our Ohio line. That's your search term right there. For Asian longhorn ticks in Ohio, um, I'm in a working group with uh, members of the same college that I'm in, which is FAES. I'm in Extension, which is a department in FAES. 
the College of Veterinary Medicine, and then ODH, ODA, and multiple different public health organizations to uh, create a working group because we just have tick expansion so fast and so aggressive that we need to match that speed of tick expansion with public health knowledge expansion. Okay, so my goal for this is to mildly to moderately terrify all attendees. Uh, when I was in private practice, what I was taught at the vet school was you need to say something to a client three times before they remember that, but I only get one shot at talking to you folks, and so I want to make an impression on, on day one, but I like to follow up the scary stuff with the ways to keep yourself safe. So let's talk about what we can do to keep ourselves safe. The first thing you want to know is make sure you're familiarize yourself with the correct removal of a tick because there's one million ways out there and there's nearly one million bad ways and in fact incorrect removal of a tick increases your chance of tick vector disease because if you just grab it by its butt or you know put a match out on it or all the weird ways that i heard when i was a veterinarian you're likely to cause that tick to constrict and squeeze its gut contents into you, the host or, or your animal or whatever, which could increase your chance of disease. You need to get the tick out. And remember, it has harpoon mouth parts and it is cemented in with glue that it's secreted. So it's holding on very, very tightly because it expands to many, many times its size as it feeds over time. You need to get all the way down to the base and get the head part. And then you go straight up firmly um, without yanking to get that tick and, and you wanna get the mouth part and the cement plug out too, then you wash your hands and you wash the spot and you save that tick because you wanna get it identified. It can go to your public health uh, organization in your county. And also if you have disease concerns, there are laboratories that can test that tick to see if disease was present, right? Because if disease is present, then you have a chance of disease. But if there's no disease in the tick, then it would be unlikely you would have disease, you might still get the allergy. We're creating a laboratory at Ohio State to do that testing. It should be up hopefully soon. And then you need to continue sort of with your personal protective plan, almost developing a kind of armor. And I recommend permethrin treated clothing. You can treat your own. You would use a permethrin product that is labeled for fabric because there's 1 million permethrin products because it's been around for a long, long time. So there are fabric labeled ones and, and you can go on the internet. My favorite place to look for like YouTube videos or, or information on ticks would be tickencounter.org. That's all one word, tick encounter. Um, or you can you can you know purchase your clothes every outfitter that is out there um, anymore seems to have some permethrin treated clothing for sale the nice thing about permethrin is it bonds to fabric so it will have a labeled number of washes keep in mind that say if it's labeled for 20 washes uh, on the 21st time it's not um, all gone like anything you can imagine it, it sort of degrades over time so it's it's more effective early on in the cycle then you couple your permethrin-treated clothings with a topical repellent, and that is one that goes on your skin. And with both of the self-treat permethrin or the topical repellents, make sure that you read, understand, and follow the label. The label is the law. It's actually federal law, and you are required to follow it. But it's also good reading because it tells you what to use in certain circumstances and how long it lasts and, and all the things you know, need to know to keep yourself safe. So I tell folks, when it comes to repellents especially, read, understand, and follow that label, but you're required to do it um, regardless with all these products. All right, so we have some take homes. One take home is this, like I said, tick diseases are prevention diseases. I don't want anybody here to get bit by a tick ever because the chances now are so high of you contracting a disease from that bite because the positivity rates are extraordinarily high. And then we need to understand that we have some myths out there, but, but those myths are just that. It, it is different now. Tick world is different and it changed pretty quickly. It really went to a fast change in the last dozen years. And, um, and so understand that. Understand you can encounter a tick anywhere outside any time of the year and you don't want it to bite you because transmission can start quickly depending on tick and disease. They can vector lots of different stuff, bacteria, viral, protozoal, I need to add that. See, I need to update the slide deck already. Make sure that you have a personal plan for safety. Permethrin treated clothes and repellents. I like long pants and long sleeves. I like light colors so that you can see a tick on you and get it off. Be aware of where ticks are in the environment. If I'm hiking down a pathway, I'm more likely to try to stay down the middle if I can help it. And if I have to go off trail, then I do a tick check immediately because ticks, once they attach via questing, 
they're going to start to move to their feeding spot and they have different places they like to feed. Realize that your four legged friends our companion animal buddies can break biosecurity. They don't do their own tick checks and they're tick magnets and they don't um, and they don't have any awareness of the threat. So work with your veterinarian to make sure that you're using the best product that fits in your budget to protect your furry friends. Understand the proper removal for um, ticks. Make sure that you save that tick if you want to save it to submit it. Um, my favorite way to you know, preserve that tick is you can just put it in a Ziploc bag, but you can um, preserve it also in hand sanitizer, which we all have around and anymore all over the place because that tick can be submitted. We, we want to get it identified for sure. Um, because we uh, need to you know, do a better job of creating our database to share with the public on what's out there, where it is, and, and what's going on. But you can also submit that for testing to do any disease rollouts. All right, and that is that on my slide. So what I wanna do is see if I can't get back into the Zoom room. There I am. All right, and let me see what's in the Q&A. Or if you have specific questions, we have 19. Um, you are welcome to ask away. I would like to take this moment to speak for everyone that I am horrified and alarmed. Sweet. And uh, yeah, if anyone has any questions <laughs> for Tim. Um, I'm seeing, so I was gonna, one of my questions for you was going to be kind of the recommended permission treatment. I've seen some places that you can send your clothes out to get them treated or you can treat it yourself. Um, is it kind of just the longevity of the treatment that? I, I think so. I think so. So like a, a commercial company can basically just dip them in a vat for a long time and let that bond. Um, I've treated my own pants. I got a pair of Carhartts that I wear when I know that I am going to be off trail. They're light colored tan so I can see stuff on them. And I put them on that hanger that has the clips and I went out to my garage because I wanted to do it out in the garage because I do have cats and cats are toxic mm -hmm. to permethrin until it dries. And so I treated my, my hiking boots and I treated my pants and then I let them dry. And I do that each year. Um, so uh, that is something that I do. You can purchase uh, your clothing. I, I do remember where you could take a box of clothes and for a set fee, you could mail them in, they would treat them and send them back. Um, you know, the US military has treated the, um, the uniforms of our troops for decades because they know that they have soldiers that are gonna be out there crawling right through tick habitat. And so <laughs> however you do it and you're comfortable with doing it, um, uh, I recommend you read up on it. And then, like I said, if you're going to do it yourself, you get a tick, you get a permethrin product label for fabric because you'll see topical permethrins because they use them for head lice, but they're not effective. Um, that is something you need to do. And so, um, Brittany, yes, is there any negative environmental effects in permethrin? Yes. Um, I get that question a lot. So permethrin would kill every single non-target species it comes into contact with, except probably bed bugs, quite honestly. The, um, that's, a, that's the problem that we have. And a lot of people ask about treating a, an environment for ticks and you have pluses and minuses when you do that. And one of the minuses is that you are going to have a, uh, you're gonna have non-target species affected because it, it would wipe everything out. And you have to read, understand and follow the label. So if you're gonna spray something that say has a B label on it, then you make sure that you spray at times of the day or on crops where you're not going to have effect on that. And in fact, there's really good information out there for environmental control of ticks. It is out of the University of Connecticut. Um, if you wanna Google that, they have a whole manual that goes over where ticks are in the environment. And, you know, if you have a, say, a backyard that's grass and then you have like sort of forest or, or forest edge around the outside, 80% of the ticks are going to be within three meters of the edge habitat. They're not going to be in the middle of the yard, although I've gotten ticks on me in the middle of a sunny yard. Um, but your greatest percentage is going to be, you know, in that leaf litter um, or in sort of understory brush. And, you know, this is a crowd that will appreciate this, but we've seen increased numbers of ticks in habitat that have um, Invasives, right? Barbary. Oh. Uh, we just did. We just published a fact sheet on Barbary. There's research that shows there's that that is the ideal habitat for ticks, and I've seen some uh, research on honeysuckle too. So if you didn't hate them enough, that was going to be my next question: was do they thrive on the invasives? <laughs> They thrive in the habitat that invasives provide, yes. And so Melissa asked, 
um, let's see. That's, oh, that's sorry. I've been publishing them. So if you go to publish, they are. There we go. Is there a possibility to do a tick drag study at our parks or public program? Yes, 100%. And in fact, you know, um, the there's great to learn how to do a tick drag. There's great videos that are just online on YouTube, um, but it wouldn't be a bad idea. I would love to see um, tick drags and, and like metro parks or things like that. The first Longhorn tick found in Franklin County was just on a tr on a hiking trail like Allen Creek Trail or over that way uh, near Easton. Uh, and but but something like metro parks like they did that study in Pennsylvania is going to show people in the city, right? Because our concentrations of our population are in the city. So um, it wouldn't be a bad idea if um, if we're looking at doing that in Franklin County, you can we can work on something for that maybe in the spring. Um, Julie says, what is the best way to remove a tick when you don't have tweezers available? There are tick tools that you can get and, and I would recommend that. There are no best ways if you don't have a, a pointy tweezers. I mean, I've seen, you'll see on the internet like put dish liquid or something that makes them let go like they have hands or something. They're cemented in. Um, that you that tool is really the, the way that you need to get down there because the headpiece once they start feeding if they're on there for a little bit they you start to get an inflammatory reaction at the site which can make it even harder to remove and so i get that um periodically um question and i i really i don't have great recommendations if you don't have that on there because you you you're going to find that is your best way to do it. So if I stuck a tick in the freezer, can it still be tested? How long can you wait? You know, I don't know how any research that shows sort of longevity in the freezer, but I would I would say contact the testing lab. And since our OSU one is coming online soon, but not quite there, the um, the one that I re recommend right this minute, and that's going to change when we open, but tick report, uh, tick report, all one word, tickreport.com. And so contact them and talk to them if you want to get it submitted. And then we see I saw online that there's testing through OSU. Yes, uh, it, I'd have to look and see if they opened it up. Uh, we work very, very closely with ODH in Reynoldsburg. And in fact, when ticks get submitted there, they generally then will make it to OSU because we're going to be the site of testing. So, um, but I don't know if the public interface where you can submit through the portal is open yet. And if I find that it is um, in the short term, I will email you um, both Laura and Brittany and they can share it out. Uh, all right, sufficiently horrified. Good, good, good. Is how is this information shared to the medical community? So, um, the medical community has been a little bit slow to kind of adapt to this. It, and in their defense, there really wasn't good testing. Um, and in the speed of which this has spread in Ohio is also working as a negative. But they are they are coming around, especially when we're located in a place that has um, that ticks are well known for being a problem and and now we're seeing that actually in the city as well so when if you when you go through the recording if you go back to that map where you have positivity generally where you see lots of um the green dots on the map is where the uh public health orgs are all in and when i did that program in tuscarawas county there was a doctor there and he spoke to here's what signs you see and here's what you talk to your doctor about and here's the test work we're, we're going to do and, and here's our treatment regimen so it it is expanding plus um we started last year year the uh, a tick symposium and we brought together researchers from all over the nation and the Air Force and the CDC to meet at Ohio State to go over the most recent research and, and bring people together to do discussions on it and watch for us having uh, another one. The Ohio Regional Tick Symposium will be back for its second iteration next fall. Um, do you recommend the duct tape method for checking for seed ticks? Yeah, uh, or that cat hair roller. I mean, if you can get them off you, because, so a, you can have a seed tick bomb, which basically in a lot of cases, especially out in the woods, is probably Lone Star ticks where they just hatched and crawled up a, a branch and you you walk through it and all of a sudden you look down and you just have, it looked like somebody sprinkled poppy seeds all over you. Um, a, a lint hair roller or duct tape can do that as well. And then people will put duct tape around their pant cuffs to tape them. And then they'll put an outward faced layer of duct tape at those cuffs. And so if any any ticks try to crawl up, they get stuck on those. I've seen that as well because they are nearly impossible to see. The best way to protect your head or your hair, um, you know, it, I've, I somebody shared with me that that some of the products are the label says do not apply apply to hats, um, but uh, double check your label 
that will tell you what you can apply it for. Um, for DEET, you know, that's considered a fabric, and so they're not going to probably recommend that a topical is going to be applied to a fabric, so it might be permethrin if the label says that's okay. Keep in mind this, ticks don't, you know, they don't fly and they don't drop out of trees. They, they attach to their host via questing, and so what questing is, is keep in mind ticks also, they are not insects, they're actually arthropods related to spiders. Their, um, their adult form has eight uh, legs, four pairs, same with their, um, with their nymphal form, but they hold on to the vegetation with their back two pair legs and they quest with their front two and they grab you usually at some part in the midline or lower. When they're larval or nymphal forms, they grab lower. They're going to be feeding on lower small mammals, and then they're going to be not as far up in the vegetation, although over time they can crawl up in it. But they grab you and then they move to the head. And so um, I would say for your face and your neck and, and all that stuff, a repellent would be good. And you would check the label to see if you can uh, put that on a uh, headgear. And so, you know, it, do parks have anything to prevent ticks near trails? They have nothing other than signage to warn people about the risks. And in fact, Metro Parks has really increased their signage lately. They had some members detected the, the tick symposium. And the reason is that ticks, while they don't run fast, they actually run pretty fast for their size, um, but they have the ability to move on, on mammals. And so a tick can be carried for miles and repopulate an area very, very quickly. And studies have shown that if you treat an area for ticks, it, it's not very long before they repopulate back to high levels. Um, so Anonymous asks, once a tick drag is performed, what is the next step? Really, the, the, most, uh, the most research and recommendations are trying to prevent the tick bite on the person as opposed to eliminate the ticks in the environment. Now, there's been a tremendous amount of research done on eliminating ticks in the environment. It's just very difficult, time consuming, and it has to be constant all year round in very high pressure. So if you go and you check online, and it's an online link for that, um, you, the University of Connecticut Tick Environmental Control Handbook that is a number of pages, but it's a really dynamite one. They talk about how they try to control deer or they'll use tick tubes for mice where they they put permethrin impregnated like cotton in it and the mics take it back to their burrows or they build feeding stations for deer that have per, permethrin impregnated so when they stick their head in to get food out of a, out of the opening they get that on them so that it kills ticks and they work great you just have to have tons of them in the environment per square mile um, and you have to manage them and refill them constantly and if you don't do that all constantly the ticks repopulate so who do we contact about doing a program? I'm in Vinton County. Um, so contact your extension office and see if they would like to do a program for you in Vinton County. The way you would find any of your extension offices is it is countyname.osu.edu. So it'd be vinton.osu.edu or it'd be gallia.osu.edu or franklin.osu.edu. Um, that is how you would get a hold of them. And I create and share every single year a PowerPoint for all of my Ag Educator colleagues, so they would have most of this presentation material available to them to do a presentation if you wanted to do that. Um, I've actually been down to Vinton, but it's been several years since I was down that way. And then see, I live in a farm. If I put a tick in a jar of alcohol, can they be tested? Yep, you can. Um, ticks are preserved in alcohol and they can still be tested. And then, so this is a really interesting que question from Brittany. Be because I've been asked this a lot, and I'm sure they do. It, it, do ticks have an essential purpose in our ecosystem? Can we get rid of all of them? I, I would like to if I snapped my finger and made them just uh, be gone. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, I'm assuming that they do. I don't know what it is. And then another question that was asked to me, um, and, and I just kind of thought about it, and I don't have that answer either, but this is a crowd that will appreciate this. Usually, not usually, but sometimes when we have an invasive come in, if there's something that eats it for food, then we see the secondary growth of the thing that eats it for food, right? So the goby went into Lake Erie, and then we had the Lake Erie water snake, which eats gobies, have a resurgence in their populations and stabilized. But we were talking um, before this started about like there, there was a study that was published years and years ago about how possums eat ticks in, in heavy numbers. And what we've actually found is possums are not tick va vacuums. That study was flawed. But I don't know of a species that eats them in high enough numbers. Now, 
I do a lot of programs um, with livestock and, and including poultry, and I've had poultry keepers for years tell me that the area and the poultry uh, where the poultry can forage has been um, generally tick free because birds will eat ticks. That's going to be something they'll just peck and eat. They would love it. That's a um, that's a protein snack for them. But I've also seen where the Asian longhorn tick has bred in such numbers that it overwhelmed uh, and killed a chicken from from um, blood loss anemia. So that would be like if literally if your food ate you like if 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 bacon cheeseburgers just attacked me and I was trying to eat them, but there were so many of them that they took me down. Um, that would be the analogy for that. So crazy to think about. I want to make sure we don't have any questions. One more. I just uh, want more. All two right. more. Sorry. Uh, yes, yeah. so on that Ohio line um, website, the um, the there is a, a basically just tick prevention ticks in Ohio and how to prevent yourself that is got a lot of great information about that and that is a that is a free and easily downloaded print um, a fact sheet. So if you go into Ohio line, there's really there's only a handful of things on ticks. There's the Asian longhorn one that I showed you, and then there is a general tick fact sheet on Ohio line. There's great information on tick encounter. I'm actually working with the uh, there's a, a department at Ohio State called the Knowledge Exchange, and they do large um, data and research sort of you know conglomerations, and we are creating a spot that will be hosted by Ohio State that will collate all of this sort of data we're collecting from all of our partner organizations as well as all the preventative information and research that's new and everything. So we will have a one stop, one click spot at some point that we can then send to um, people can use and just click on. We have a tick card through OSU Publishing that is a purchasable thing um, We that we have the, that's laminated and you carry it in your wallet and do identification on, but we have sold out of those. That's how popular that is. And we had updated it two years ago to add the, um, Asian longhorn tick, and, and we now need to update it again and add the Gulf Coast. Uh, that's how fast things are changing. But since it's sold out, me and our tick working group colleagues here at Ohio State are modifying the tick card to get the new one out so that we can um, have that available to uh, distribute. I think the last question was one from Joshua. All right. Do I have that? I have Stormy. Oh, there's Joshua. Right, oh, I, I, I jumped. Sorry, Joshua. Um, with no wide scale control methods available, is the future of management concentration database public health notifications similar to COVID-19 warnings? Um, maybe. I hate to say, but I read an article uh, in a science journal that they thought that the next large public health emergency is going to be tick vector disease. And we will have to do a number of different things. They are um, coming out with a Lyme vaccine for people, and that will be helpful for people for Lyme disease. That's in trials right now. I think it might even be in human trials. They are coming out with a monoclonal antibody for Lyme disease in people. And we do still have uh, antibiotics that have uh, not had resistance to the um, major infections from ticks. And we, so far so good, do not have widespread resistance to the very few acaricides that we have for ticks. Uh, there has been a recent um, approval on newt ketone, which is a essential oil topical repellent that was um, FDA approved. And so what, what I basically think we're going to have to do, Joshua, is a, a little bit like COVID, sort of a general integrated pest management strategy where we have to use lots of things. It's going to be awareness. It's going to be preventatives or repellents. It's going to be um, acaricides. It's going to be, uh, you know, lots of different things. And the, the key is, is to, the key for me and in what we do at Extension, we radiate the knowledge and research of the Ohio, of Ohio State University to all Ohioans is to not only engage you guys you know, because you're you're our client residents of Ohio, but you are in a spot where you're going to engage the public as well. They're going to come to you and they're going to ask you questions because you are content experts in your fields and and be that sort of evangelist for tick safe behavior so that we can uh, raise awareness because we still have people that have very little knowledge that this is a problem now because they um, they remember what ticks like were like in the past and, and they were unaware that it, the changes have occurred so rapidly in such a short period of time. Ooh. 
All right. Well, we are at time. Um, those were an amazing amount of questions. Thank you so much, everyone that attended. And thank you so much, Tim, for uh, putting the fear of six back into me. Anytime. <laughs> Better the fear so, than uh, Lyme disease. Indeed. Yeah, that's not something that any of us want. Um, so, yeah, thank you again for joining us today. Um, and we will. Uh, oh, real quick for people still in attendance on the 17th, we're doing a talk about field attire, and I'm sure we will talk a little bit about permethrin treated things uh, or treat yourself because that is very important now. Um, all right. Thank you all and we'll see you next time. Thanks, Tim.